Hey, hi, Ron. Hey, Ron. How are you doing? Great to see you. You good. Too. And you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, Great. So how, how is how is the situation uh, so far? Um, the Shanghai situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, things are kind of a mess, but hanging in there. Do Do you have sufficient uh, supplies? Yeah. Um, we have supplies. Yeah. Yes. We're, yeah. Yeah. But it's um, it's always a struggle each day to get some. But we're we're doing okay. The other day, I was trading vegetables, like some vegetables for some other vegetables. Some other neighbor had this vegetable. I had this. So we just made a trade. Oh, so so there's no control in the package of what you're gonna get, right? Or, or it's... no, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a little bit tricky. Yeah, actually, today when I drive, I I, I listen to NPR. There was a um, interview with a, I think, a journalist in in Shanghai, and he he she mentioned exactly the same trading. Uh, yeah. Yeah, between neighbors and uh, among neighbors, and yeah. Yeah, so people have been incredibly helpful and generous, and everyone's That's working great. together through a tough That's situation. Great. Do you want to test out your slides? Yeah, let me see if I can share. Start. Is the right screen? Or... Yeah, it looks great. Oh, no, I cannot. Oh, it's moving? You are yep. sure. Okay. Are you, oh, sorry, do you guys see the two bar or no? Or... No, no. Great, great. Okay, let me stop sharing <laughs> okay, here. And uh, yeah, good. The Cleveland lab postdocs always have the same format of slides, I think. Yeah, yeah. So we are all <laughs> trained the same way. <laughs> and it's yeah. hard to <laughs> yeah, get, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm still fresh, so <laughs> I haven't lost a memory yet. But I, I yeah, I actually started, I, I didn't quite um get why we present this way or why others present this way, but now uh, the longer, <laughs> yeah, with now that I think we have kind of quite appreciate this, this color scheme and how to highlight, how to do. Yeah, I think it's quite effective. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Margaret. Hey. Hi. Uh, I don't think I can share my screen. My God. Where, where can uh, I share my screen? Oh, here. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Here. I can. Uh, Hold on, I don't know. Oh, let me open my, can, can, should we try? Yes, please. Okay, hold on. Okay, can you see it? Yep. So uh, what is the function that I can stop the hackers for? <laughs> uh, oh, don't, yeah, don't worry. I'll, I'll be on top of it. Okay. Uh, okay, so I don't need to click on any buttons or something. When... Yeah, you could probably, like I, I disabled some things and put up some other features, but uh you can like stop I sharing i guess but i oh yeah, okay I... okay so if it happens i'll just stop sharing yeah you can just do that but i i've sort of added some security features oh okay all right let me stop my sharing then it should be it should work How's, how is everything going? We are still in lockdown. <laughs> so yeah. it's, uh, yeah, Same. it's 
it's in lockdown. But you, and... but you guys are in a more intense, like you can't even, a more intense lockdown. No food yeah. delivery. Yeah. So um, because the university has more strict rules. So um, yeah, they deliver food to us, but we can't go out or anything. My lab has been shut down for 10 days or actually 12 days already. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of a mess. I Aaron. Know, yeah. Hi, Jen. How are you? Hi. Good, good. And now they said there's a new new policy where they'll divide Shanghai into th three zones. And if there's no cases within 14 days, they can do mm -hmm. something. And if there's one case, it's another, it keeps repeating. So I think this is going to, turn into a squid game or something where everyone's gonna <laughs> try to try to like find out if their neighbors are positive and get them out mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it's a mess especially even now Google. like yeah there's a sort of gossip around oh i heard all these crazy like i heard this neighbor has is positive or this like everyone's like um going crazy i think yeah it is yeah wow it's yeah really i don't crazy. know what... like i was um <laughs> I was, uh, I mean, I, as you know, I live in a fancy apartment, really fancy neighborhood, mm -hmm. and I was getting food, like, amazing food every day. And then like the next week, I was literally waiting in line, long line for like rice and cabbage from the government. <laughs> that was like, <laughs> <laughs> changes, like, changes really, really fast. Uh, special I have, experience. I so. heard the flight from US to Shanghai, actually, actually departing from Dallas, the FW, um, they cut the, the um like the vacancy or no not the vacancy they cut the amount of um boarding to mm -hmm. half so it was like 70 mm percent -hmm. now it's a 40 percent so they're actually people are like hoping to go back but they're like suddenly they, their their ticket mm -hmm. got canceled yeah. recently like uh, just this these few days yeah mm -hmm. it is yeah. yeah yeah the stanford Dean's chief of staff contacted me and said, Aaron, is everything okay? How can we help you? And I said, send, send the Stanford helicopter to get me out of here. <laughs> Aaron. Hi. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Gregory. It's long. I see you. Hi, Zalong. Yeah. I see. So, so, so long was very active on uh, MIT BBS. I, 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 <laughs> when oh, I was a student. Man, that was... I, I, I read uh, his post. <laughs> 15, 15 years ago, something like yeah, that. Yeah. 15 years ago. Yeah. It's a pretty enjoying like reading this bio, bio, biology no. board. Yeah, there was. Quite, getting, quite a... getting, yeah. getting yeah. old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was sort of the predecessor to WeChat. Right, right. Sure, uh, Aaron and uh, Zalong, where's the champagne? Yeah. We... <laughs> yeah, that's a good uh, point. Thanks, um... we, we have yeah, some Mao Tai. I was saving Mao <laughs> Tai. <laughs> so, uh, as a Qingdao <laughs> <Chindal, laughs> beer. Qingdao <laughs> beer for this, uh, this well, last year or something, right? Anyway. Yeah. yeah, when we started this, it was lockdown, stay at home, kind of chaotic. Two years later, I don't know. What yeah, it's changed. It's, it's, <laughs> another lockdown. <laughs> uh, Are you in Shanghai? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Aaron, you're in Shanghai? Yeah. Well, yeah. I was uh, expecting to see some like weight loss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you look fine. <laughs> yeah. It is, it is interesting trying to go out and get. Uh, figure out what to eat each day, which, but we're, we're we're okay. People have been helping each other, which is really nice. Yeah, okay. yeah last um, Christmas we got trapped in uh, Lake Tahoe because of the snowstorm, and okay. then so for two days we couldn't move the car and had to hike out to get food. It was quite wow. some experience. Wow. I have to say, you know, worrying about food is not something that we constantly experience, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. How's how's Stanford? It's very windy. It's it, it there's a storm going on right now, so it's pouring this morning and now it's sunny but extremely windy. That probably nothing compared to 
<laughs> out of places at this point. Hi, Zhang. Hey there. Yeah, we just finished the champagne. You missed it. Oh, man. So if, if you keep this up, you're going to run out of neuroscientists to give talks, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking about. Like, yeah, I don't think so. I think there's, I think it's just that normal seminar series committees aren't as creative and just come up with the same people over and over again. I think there's a lot out there. But this is, this is 200 seminars over the course of two years, right? Yeah, I'm surprised yeah. we haven't, well, I mean, Mia and Aaron and Mia, have, we don't have to run up by ourselves again, right? So, yeah. I don't have anything new to present anyway. <laughs> Aaron, before you start, and then give a minute, um, we're going to say a couple words. Oh, wow. <laughs> You're not going to do like a TikTok dance or something. Well, I wish I could, but I... You can, you can. <laughs> you should. <laughs> Just so that you're not... Uh... I do think, yeah, like Khan is good. Maybe Khan has a bottle of champagne right in. <laughs> I'm not the whole. You are the ring leader, Jin. You, you, you go ahead and make our, represent us. Um, I wasn't the ring leader. <laughs> I just spontaneously um, got reminded by... Um, about a year ago, two years ago, almost a year ago. Now it's two years ago. Erin, are you wearing your hoodie? Actually, Jung, that's what you're doing. Exactly. Okay. So that's wow. time. Um, <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, since it's uh, 5 p.m. And um, I'm not the organizer of your Zoom, um, but I think not everybody know, but at least a fraction of people know that NeuroZoom was started by Aaron and Chilong almost exactly two years ago. And the two of them as a speaker on April 13 and round us all oh. together and um, has been carrying on for the past two years, except one or two breaks and um, overall 100 um, talks. And I know there's another 100 more to go and I wish them, first of all, I think we should all, if we can, show our face and to thank um, Aaron and Zolong for this wonderful thing that he um, created. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. <laughs> thank the you, Aaron, thanks is really, thanks yeah. much. Thanks. The, the thanks is really to everyone who came here. Um, really, um, Zolong and I just, started this because we were bored and wanted to have a joint group meeting and thought if other people wanted to join and then it's just kept kept going on. So um, yeah, so there's, this is the two year anniversary, the hundredth, hundredth session. So the 200th science talk. Um, I can't, there were, there was a couple of talks. I was worried if they would be just average, but all of them have been really outstanding. I haven't I haven't missed a single one of these. I, I skip my faculty meeting and other meetings all the time, but this is one I never miss. Um, I'm not sure if there's any discernible broader significance of the trajectory of NeuroZoom, but I think it just means that it's important that science is an international endeavor and open to all and that we, we continue to have um, personal exchanges of science and ideas and um, I, we never imagined it would last this long. Um, and it's really been an honor to get to virtually sit, sit with everyone. Um, I've got to learn a lot of great science. So I hope, and it also shows that this is, this is the type of thing that's easy, easy to do at high impact. And um, I'm on your website and I have to say, it's so impressive. You put together every week and this, um, very simple poster, but it's very memorable. Thank you. Of course, so the simple always... part. <laughs> <laughs> the simple part is just that it's I, it's I'm doing it. So I, I, I don't know how to do anything fancy. So it's just a simple. That's why it's simple. And we certainly wish you are well. And after two years being locked down on the other side of the world. Thanks. So that's going to change, yeah. hopefully soon. <laughs> yes. So that's yours. Thanks.
thanks everyone. It's it's really great to uh, be able to keep in touch, and um, I'm also sure that everyone in China and around the world really really appreciates it as well. Can I say a quick word, Aaron? Yeah, please. You're going to give and all wanna, of us brain grant grant funding. Right? I want to echo uh, Jin's comments and. You and Zilong managed to <clears throat> build a community under the worst of circumstances. You can imagine an international community, and it really does uh, a great. It's a great embodiment of this saying of of uncertain origin that in crisis lies opportunity. Um, you not only started a great tradition, you maintained it over two years, which is really really quite incredible. I am hoping that once we get out from under the work this pandemic we can continue uh, these conversations, these discussions, but occasionally in person. The only downside of that will be, we may not be able to meet on NeuroZoom if we're meeting in person, but I think that would be okay. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much, you guys, for doing this. Thanks to everybody who's showed up. It's been, been a, a great way to learn science and actually learn science from around the world. So thank, thanks again. Thanks, thanks, John. And the point is, is well taken that tough circumstances brings out the best in people and especially now things are tough in shanghai but i've seen nothing but people coming together to help each other and um so just like we'll keep helping each other with science all right um so long should we get started yeah sure go ahead okay okay great so welcome everyone to another start of another year of NeuroZoom. And um, we have great speakers coming up and we'll keep going. And next week um, we have two more great talks. We have um, a talk from Shinjie Chung from UPenn about uh, sleep and emotional regulation and Corey Harwell from UCSF talking about um, synapse development and hedgehog um, signaling. Okay, so um, please tune in. Please let um, Salong and me know if uh, you'd like to present your work. We'd lo love to have you. Uh, we have great speakers throughout June. We have slots open in the end of June and then throughout the summer. Um, so you can check out the webpage. Uh, you can check out the um, YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that. Okay, so um, our first speaker is um, Dr. Haiyan Yu. He's an assistant professor um, at UT Southwestern. And um, I've known um, Haiyang for a while. He is a rising star in the ALS field. Um, he um, originally did his, or he did his undergraduate degree in China in Nankai University. And then he went to WashU for his um, PhD studying um, uh, Roji GPAs. I first got to know him when he started his postdoctoral fellowship at UCSD with Don Cleveland. And here he started working on the ALS protein TDP43. He'll tell you the details, but basically he, um, through a beautiful set of experiments, um, he worked out details of how the phase separation of uh, TDP43 in which it can form these really beautiful rings, which he'll show you, um, seems to be very important for its uh, normal function and its uh, and uh, contributes to its, its role in, in, in disease. Um, his slides and data are beautiful and that just is that, but it also means he has a uh, real deep understanding of the science and a way of communicating it. Um, and he, since, uh, since last year, has been an assistant professor um, in the uh, Neurogenerum Disease Center at UT Southwestern and, and part of the um, Brain Institute there. So really looking forward, forward to hearing your latest, hi. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really uh, honored to be <laughs> uh, the um, to present at this uh, actually two year anniversary of the NeuroZoom. And actually, um, um, since the lockdown, the NeuroZoom has been the only thing that I look forward weekly uh, to to listen to and uh, to watch um, other people's great uh, great works, and also to see people before that I never met and just read their names on papers, but now I can actually see their faces and, and see their, uh, read their works. Um, so let me share my screen. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes, that's good. Okay, good. Uh, let me see. Okay. 
All right, so uh, today I, I'm gonna give you a summary of my uh, recent work um, on, on TDP43 liquid liquid phase separation um, in cells and in neurons uh, and in vivo. Uh, and also, I, I just actually I started uh, six, about six months ago and I have uh, just some brief updated uh, unpublished uh, work. And I wish that uh, it would be uh, interesting and trigger. Uh, trigger your um, your interest of uh, using maybe a similar method on your own uh, uh, studies. Um, so uh, it's actually quite interesting that uh, for 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 the neuroscience people that uh, for for us we we study neural degeneration. We are not really studying how the neurons uh, function. We study how the neuron die. It's kind of like a very boring question. However. Um, uh, the neurons die uh, in neurodegenerative disease in a very bizarre way, and so far we don't really know anything about how they die. And there were there were many hypotheses of, uh, especially in Alzheimer's disease, disease uh, and um, and later uh, ALS and uh, frontal temporal dementia. But uh, again, most of the current hypothesis hasn't been proven 100% right. And then they were mostly uh, like the the drugs that was developed. Uh, for, uh, based on these hypotheses hasn't been very successful. So this still remains as a major uh, problem uh, of, uh, of age-related um, neurodegeneration. So today, um, my focus is actually TDP43. Uh, this protein uh, was initially found by um, uh, Virginia Lee and John uh, Chernovsky, who recently um, passed away, sadly. Um, it's a great loss for the neuropathology uh, field. Um, in uh, frontal temporal dementia with uh, ubiquitination uh, dep deposits. And um, it's also been found uh, in um, present in almost, er uh, almost every ALS cases, except a few uh, familial inherited uh, ALS. So uh, the TDP43 um, normally uh, is a nuclear uh, RNA binding protein, normally goes uh, stays in the nucleus and um, in the um, in the affected neurons in patient um, post-mortem tissues, they actually accumulate at uh, astronomical level, uh, and uh, they mostly uh, accumulate in the cytoplasm with a nuclear clearance. And uh, in cases uh, where people don't, um, most people don't really, or most um, uh, pathologists don't really focus on, is actually that there are also nuclear irrigation, uh, which I'm gonna cover later in, in, my, in my talk. And uh, the, path the classic pathology was found in uh, over 95% of ALS cases, uh, except uh, the patients carrying SOD1 mutations or fast mutations. And um, it also found uh, close to half of uh, frontal temporal dementia patients. And uh, increasing evidence has shown um, this, uh, uh, this pathology uh, also associated with, uh, with hippocampus sclerosis in uh, Alzheimer's patient. And also not, uh, recently there is a new uh, disease based on TDP43 pathology, um, which is called limbic predominant age-related uh, TDP43 encephalopathy, which uh, is um, show, shown as uh, a cognitive decline in the, in the most senior people, but they don't really have a classic uh, tau or, uh, or A beta deposition. Uh, and later they were found actually TDP43 is uh, one of the major uh, pathological markers. So this protein contains um, a N-terminal uh, domain uh, that uh, is unique for TDP43 uh, compared to its uh, family RNA binding uh, uh, HNRMP proteins. Um, and it has two RNA, uh, RNA binding domains. And the C-terminal, it has this uh, low complexity region, which believed to form, uh, uh, which is believed to be aggregation prone. And also uh, it can uh, have this demixing behavior. So in healthy neurons, this protein uh, in the nucleus have um, uh, this normal function is pre rna splicing, and it also facilitates microRNA biogenesis. It can also facilitate uh, RNA shuttling, MRI stability, and mediate stress stress re response. It also can uh, facilitate RNA transport to the distal end of the of the neuron. And uh, an interesting function of TDP43 is that it auto regulates itself. So uh, its poly A tail has a TDP43 binding site. So under normal condition, the, it will produce a, uh, a normal MRA that will produce a functional TDP43 translocate in the nucleus. 
uh, while when the nuclear TDP force rate level goes up, then uh, the binding of uh, excessive binding of TDP will, will incorporate a cryptic axon uh, to itself and make its, uh, its uh, natural stop codon a premature stop codon. Then uh, it will trigger the nonsense mitigated decay pathway that will degrade the MRA and reduce TDP for the level. Uh, one of my uh, uh, lab mates uh, identified a, uh, a motor neuron specific uh, microtube binding protein, Stasmin 2, uh, and uh, uh, is uh, actually very responsive to TDP43 regulation. So if you <coughs> lose 50% TDP43 in the nucleus, you lose almost 90 or 95% of the, trans, uh, of the trans, uh, trans, uh, normal transcription uh, of Stasmin 2. And uh, very recently, uh, a uh, from a uh, Aaron's group and uh, uh, and um, Michael Ward and uh, Frata's group, they uh, uh, published back to back in Nature. I think within within a month about uh, this um, an, another uh, ALS risk gene uh, on thirteen A. Um, the splicing is also controlled by TDD forty three, and um, these um, this is uh, one example that showing that um, in Aaron's paper showing that when you knock down TDD forty three, then um, the ARM13 way also uh, uh, is suppressed almost 100%, which demonstrates that this um, protein have a very uh, important function in regulating the, uh, uh, the these uh, genes that are important in uh, keeping the neuronal function. And during disease, then the uh, TDP can form nuclear and uh, cytoplasmic aggregates uh, in different types of neurons. So um, before forming aggregates, um, um, uh, the protein actually has to transit from a um, diffuse condition uh, to a aggregated condition. And there has been a hypothesis that in, the, in between these uh, two conditions, there is a intermediate phase where the protein now can be mixed into droplets that have higher concentration compared to the surrounding environment. Um, well, this droplet can revert back to normal condition, or it can further uh, go to the aggregation uh, form where uh, at this high concentration droplet, now the protein can form uh, maybe other structure such as uh, prion-like folding. And these will uh, become more uh, thermodynamically stable and will uh, further a template uh, soluble protein to the aggregate. So liquid liquid phase separation, I, I don't think I, I think there's a, a already uh, is a, already a very a well accepted concept and very hot field. So I don't think we need a lot of uh, uh, introduction. So basically, leak uh, protein can phase separate into two solutions from uh, under a change of uh, physical or chemical uh, chemical condition, and uh, it starts from the uniform uh, distribution of the molecule uh, to a uh, non-uniform distribution, which is kind of against the, the, the second law of uh, thermodynamic law. However, it's actually uh, this, um, uh, this uh, co uh, condensed phase versus uh, diffuse phase is more disordered compared to a uniform solution. So it's still under the uh, second uh, thermodynamic law. And liquid-liquid uh, phase separation is also believed to uh, underlie the a formation of uh, many membraneless organelles. One of the famous one is the nucleolus. There's no membrane, but the proteins form a, a clear boundary with RNA and DNA. And uh, there are also many other uh, RNA, uh, uh, R, uh, other biological functionally functional um, job um, granules or membraneless organelles that uh, was uh, mediated by these uh, proteins with such uh, uh, function. So uh, we initially find that uh, when we stain TDP43 in the nucleus uh, of either muscle cortex, new cortical neurons, or culture neurons, or model cell lines, we can see that the um, this, uh, the, na the natural protein can actually form these foci in the nucleus. And then we replace uh, endogenous uh, TDP by using a uh, fluorescently tagged TDP43 uh, and perform live imaging. What we found is that this protein can uh, these droplets can fuse in uh, from small ones can fuse into big ones, and big ones can fission into small ones. These are still uh, the underlying mechanism are still um, uh, requires uh, us to work more, especially for these fission uh, events. Uh, 
that they can actually from one big droplet they can actually separate into two small ones. And um, by using a standard photo bleaching assays, these droplets can fastly recover close to 100%, demonstrating they can exchange from the diffuse pool of TDP43. And there are actually patient mutations uh, which locate in the RNA binding domain. And when I introduce these mutations into the protein and express them in model cells, actually I see that they mostly form these large intranuclear droplets. And uh, one of the patient, uh, the, the post-mortem analysis show that the, the final pathology of, of this is still cytoplasmic irrigation. So which make us to think that maybe these nuclear droplets is uh, the initial form of the pathological change um, during, uh, uh, during neurodegenerative disease uh, containing TDP43 pathology. Uh, and there are also, uh, so also Virginia Lee's uh, group, uh, Todd Cohen, he's uh, assist, uh, now assistant professor at uh, UNC. He identified two lysine acetylation sites. When the lysine are acetylated, this um, uh, RNA binding domain also ab abolish RNA binding. So all of these variants um, interfere with RNA binding. So, so what does RNA binding do to the protein? So uh, uh, for the wild type protein, uh, we, we tag it at the C terminal with the fluorescence, and then we can actually uh, trace them um, in cells and they form a handful of droplets, no surprise as we saw before. Well, when we abolish the iron binding, now these proteins, uh, the TDP43 actually form these uh, nuclear droplets, hundreds of them, and with very, few, uh, very dim uh, diffused TDP43. And these droplets apparently have a hollow center. And compare, we, we, we don't really need statistical analysis because it's almost close to 100%. Uh, it's very, very effective. It's, very do, it's also dominant. So the mutant protein can recruit wild type protein into these droplets. So here is a movie of one cell, a uh, live cell imaging in uh, one nucleus. And you can focus on any spot of this uh, nucleus. And you can actually see that the droplets can actually fuse uh, to, to form a bigger droplet. And here is a conventional confocal 3D reconstruction showing that these droplets indeed contain a hollow center. And this, uh, in, this intracellular phase separation is so uh, obvious that you don't really need fluorescence. You can actually see them under DIC imaging. So they, they look like a craters uh, on the moon, but, but basically demonstrate that the, 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 the inside these uh, liquid bubbles, they have a different phase compared to the rim of these bubbles. And um, using classic uh, bleaching experiment, we can we show uh, I show that these uh, droplets uh, recover fastly, and uh, I also bleach half of the nucleus, and then they can quickly recover, demonstrating that each of these droplets have the same uh, property, and the, the unbleached uh, even uh, also uh, uh, within with time become evenly dimmer, and these droplets. Um, have sufficient surface tension so they can actually push away um, uh, euchromatin. Actually, you can see, uh, think about this as a cell dynamically. So these droplets moving in the nucleus and they actually, they push away the, the euchromatin and then make a little space for themselves. So they can fuse and, uh, they, yeah, and shrink and become bigger. And uh, they don't really form in the cytoplasm, but during mitosis in model cells, then they can be spilled into the cytoplasm and form these droplets. But if we, we express a, a cytoplas cytoplasmic TDP, uh, RNA binding deficient TDP, then it doesn't really form these uh, hollows, like these bubbles. So which demonstrating there are some nuclear component that uh, are required for these uh, for formation of these uh, droplets. Uh, using conventional EM, we can actually see them easily in the nucleus. These, these are so protein rich um, um, structure that um, it, basically TDP43 can actually form this very large, a, a large uniform dense um, uh, ring. Oh, this is a cross section, it's a, it's a ring, a donut shape. And uh, the average uh, thickness uh, after this uh, fixation uh, is about 150 to 190 nanometers. So next question, actually oh, here you can see that uh, the inner uh, phase is quite different from nucleoplasm. So now the question is what's inside these droplets? 
using uh, Apex mid, uh, proximity labeling developed by um, Aaron's colleague Alice Ting at uh, Stanford. We used, uh, we, we, we identified that um, only protein that enriched is HSP70 family. We actually can enrich almost every single member uh, expressed in this cell. Uh, and um, we use fluorescent imaging and uh, co-express, uh, for example, here we express uh, HSPA6 with a red fluorescent marker. And what we saw is that in the nucleus, now H uh, HSPA6 is enriched in the center of these droplets and uh, TDP, uh, TDP is uh, on the edge. While in the center, uh, in the center, the TDP concentration is about 30 to 50% of the rim. So in the center is actually a mix of both HSB70 and this uh, ion binding deficient TDP 43. So HSB70 is the ATP dependent uh, chaperone. So there's uh, uh, inhibitors developed so when we treat the cells with uh, this inhibitor, now we see that TDP43 uh, droplets become one giant uh, gel-like structure um, in the nucleus. Uh, it contains both TDP and HSP70. And interestingly, when we wash away the inhibitor, now these one big single gel can separate and become uh, this active uh, liquid droplets again. So the liquid and gel properties demonstrated by um, uh, photo bleaching uh, and recovery. So here shows that um, the control DMSO treated versus the HSP70 treated. Now I bleach one. Uh, here I, I just, for the control, I just bleach the um, HSP70 because I've already demonstrated the TDP droplets are uh, liquid, right? It's liquid. So then now um, here uh, on the other side, I bleach both TDP and HSP70. So uh, what I saw is that the HSP70 can quickly recover within 50 sec 50 sec 15 seconds, while in these gels, um, HSP70 can recover. So it remains liquid, but TDP43 cannot. So this demonstrates uh, the gel property of TDP43. And maybe the HIV-70, even under these uh, inhib inhibitory, uh, uh, the inhibitor bound HIV-70 still can move around, um, but, uh, what, uh, but um, it's not functional. But when, when, when the inhibitor is washed away, then this uh, liquid uh, HIV-70 can still um, fulfill the chaperone, chaperoning function that uh, can now uh, separate the gel-like TDP uh, in, to become droplet again. So, so far I show, only showed a mutant, uh, mutant is a mutant. Here, how, how about uh, the nitro uh, uh, acetylation case? Uh, because this is close to the endogenous. So I treated the cell uh, with a deacetylase inhibitor I can observe in these neuron-like cells, uh, I can observe that uh, there are more droplets forming. Well, then I add a um, protosome inhibitor on top of this uh, HDAC uh, inhibitor. Uh, and I can see that now TP can form these uh, droplets in cells. So uh, the reason of adding the um, uh, polysome inhibitor is that when um, semi bermudas groups uh, demonstrated when TDP is not binding to RNA, the half-life of TDP decreased by half. So I'm now trying to using pro inhibiting the polysome to stabilize TDP. And here shows the, sorry, um, in uh, iPS-derived motor neurons, um, when combined with Saha and BTZ, now these droplets um, are uh, can be formed in iPS derived uh, motor neurons. How about in vivo? So basically, um, in mice uh, treated with this polysome inhibitor, botazomib, which cannot penetrate blood brain barrier, but it can affect uh, DRG neurons because their cell body is outside the blood brain barrier. So in DRG neurons, a simple treatment of polysome inhibitor can form this anisosome uh, like structure. In uh, uh, in um, in these um, in in the rodents in both mice and rats, 
And using uh, immutable labeling, we can see that this this um, anisosome like structure contains TDB forty three. So we observe this in mice, but why we don't observe in patient? We only observe these big gels and uh, these aggregate like structure in patient. So uh, to me, uh, because a uh, patient tissue and mouse tissue are collected differently, so I'm trying to mimic the collection. So for the mice, we usually do immediate perfusion. While for patient, uh, the tissue collection is usually several hours after the, the death of the patient. So here, under perfect perfusion condition, we can observe these droplets um, uh, structure. But uh, after you uh, mimicking the uh, tissue collection uh, uh, in, uh, after the death of the patient, then um, because of rigor motors, a sign of ATP decline, uh, now we don't see this structure anymore. So ATP decline, because HSP70 is an ATP dependent um, chaperone, so the de decline of ATP will uh, inhibit the chaperone activity, which will drive this droplet to become aggregate. So in summary, so TDP, uh, under healthy condition, there's diffuse TDP where they bind to RNA, and there's a handful of them. Uh, the function of the droplets are still not known. And under disease or stress, um, this, uh, the TDP, uh, RNA unbound TDP can uh, accumulate into anisosomes, uh, and which is regulated by acetylation and deacetylation cycle. And these anisosomes um, contains uh, HSV-70 in the center. And when the HSV-70 uh, activity lo is lost, then uh, they form this um, um, intranuclear droplet. So uh, what, what, what's next? So because these uh, droplets are very strong, uh, the fluorescence is very strong and the structure is very unique. So now we are thinking about um, performing um, a compound, uh, a uh, morphology-based compound screen. So uh, this is in collaboration with uh, two uh, NIH uh, groups. Um, um, and the driver is a uh, staff scientist uh, Qi at uh, uh, NI NCATS. Um, for yeah, so National Center for Advanced uh, Translational Sciences. And the idea is uh, we just do a simple compound screen. So here, basically, we use a old library, which the compound structures are mostly, uh, is quite simple. And um, this is, this, there's no um, surprise of, or no, uh, uh, like modern uh, chemistry, it's basically this uh, old, uh, working compound that's our FDA approved. And then from this, uh, we can actually reading, by reading the diffuse versus demix, we can actually use fluorescent intensity to, 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 to distinguish them. So then we can use a simple assay to tell uh, which ones actually can decrease the, uh, the, the TDP, uh, the demix TDP signal. And now we can actually further narrow down to um, a, fair, uh, a few, uh, to like uh, less than hundred uh, compound then we do imaging based, uh, high content imaging based analysis to see how they change TDP43 behavior in, in, the, in living cells. So here is a example. So actually, first of all, uh, with DMSO, we have this, um, uh, uh, so this, uh, the uh, imager will, uh, will uh, recognize its job class and uh, highlight them. And then uh, we, so, uh, in among these uh, 50 compounds, one of them is actually HSP-90 inhibitor. This actually answers Aaron's question probably twice, uh, two, uh, one year and two years ago about if HSP-70 is inhibited, how about HSP-90? So now from this uh, initial screen, we actually identified HSP-90 inhibitor that actually promoting this uh, gel formation. So I, th I think that HSP-90 is also involved but uh, for some reason, in the in the initial screen, we didn't we only identified HSP seventy. Um, another interesting uh, compound is actually sexohexamide is a uh, is a uh, is a, uh, tran uh, is a translation inhibitor. So what it what it did is actually um, now that mainly TDP was in the nucleus. Now it's actually now go out go out and become a cytoplasmic. Uh, so this is uh, we're still uh, going through these uh, compound based. Uh, 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 screens and then uh, trying to understand by using the functional assay like the splicing assays um, pioneered by uh, Aaron, um, Michael and uh, Don 
so that uh, to, to determine how these compounds affect TDP43 function, biological function. Uh, another interesting idea actually also come from this uh, collaboration is that now we are trying to do machine learning and use uh, machine learning to, to identify uh, in a, uh, this compound in a large scale. So from the le uh, uh, lead compound, now we can con convert them um, into, um, in, into matrix. So these matrix then can be trained, <clears throat> can use them to train uh, this uh, machine learning so uh, uh, algorithm. And then it can then perform a in silico screen of a larger library. Now we will have a new, uh, new candidates and then going through this um, uh, uh, semi high throughput uh, imaging based analysis, then we can actually get new lead compound. And then we train the, uh, this uh, software to make it uh, smarter. And uh, then this software uh, can be uh, used to uh, screen other libraries that um, is not uh, processed by NIH. Uh, so then we can actually try to find even more candidates and trying to understand this, uh, the biology behind the TDP43 phase separation. And uh, indeed, these compounds will be subject to imaging and uh, uh, transcription-based uh, functional test. And then hopefully there will be some interesting candidates that we can move them to in vivo study. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank uh, my, uh, <laughs> uh, my little group here at uh, UT Southwestern. Uh, now we have four members uh, with also a rotation student uh, and then this was our first uh, lab out. You see, we don't really have any mask <laughs> in Texas anymore. And then um, the, uh, I also I'd like to thank the fun, uh, my funding resources, uh, the Indoor Scholar and uh, the uh, K99 and R00 from NDS. Although I haven't received my R00 for almost half a year, but hopefully they kind of gave me soon. Uh, and I like to thank my uh, mentor Dong and uh, postdoc mentor Dong and uh, my colleagues uh, who helped me, and also uh, collaborators for this uh, TDP40 anisosome story, um, including crowd, uh, crowd tomography uh, modeling, uh, EM, and uh, and uh, other uh, pro uh, proteomic support. And uh, this uh, machine learning based um, compound screen is actually driven by Qi and, uh, uh, and uh, Frank um, Wenpeng, so in, at uh, NCATS. Uh, with that, I will close and I will answer questions. <laughs> Thanks so much, Payan. Awesome talk, super exciting. Um, Thank you. Hong Yan, do you want to? I have a million questions, but Hong Yan, do you want to go first? Okay, yeah, now I expert go first. Um, so, yeah, uh, really amazing talk. So I'm wondering, uh, the, uh, when you found the HSP70 family in the droplets in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the nucleus, does it mean that HS70 is being sequestered, sequestered and non-functional or HSP70 is trying to help to fold TDP43? I'm just wondering which one which so is true. The chaperone function of HSP70 is required for maintain the liquid property. So the answer is that HSP70 uh, is, uh, is, is functional. And when you inhibit HSP70, either by depleting ATP or by, re uh, by using inhibitor, uh, the liquid property of these droplets disappear. So you become gel. So HSP70 uh, activity is vital for this uh, uh, structure. What, what came first? Like, is it? HSP70 is there and TDP43 formed these shells around it, or these TDP43 was doing something and HSP70 stuck in and sort of stabilized these, these shells? Actually, when, when I uh, look at these movies, uh, so the, these droplets always in, initiate as very tiny spots surround, uh, from, uh, I think it's from the nuclear pore, but it's actually at the periphery, uh, the resolution I can now tell. So uh, then it actually start to, Grow and then I just I think I think the um, when TDP is not binding to RNA, even for the wild type protein, the HSF seventy gonna come and bind to these uh, unbound RM domains to stabilize them. So I think it's a um, it's not chicken and egg, but I think when so chaperone is required for the to stabilize these R RM domains, and actually RM domains by themselves are not very stable. So when, when express these RM domains in the bacteria, they always bind to bacterial RNA. 
and these um, unimbedding deficient RMs actually <laughs> form aggregates in bacteria. So they, they don't, yeah, I think the chaperone -like function is very important. So it, it's very clear. Can I ask a question, Aaron? Sure. Uh, it's great talk. Uh, it's very clear that you showed um, the HSP70 activity is required to maintain it in this droplet. But it looks like from the localization, the concentration of your TDP43 is actually on the ring, on outside ring, which, which doesn't have the HSP70 molecule, right? Exactly. So what do you think that ring entails? What, what exactly is the state within the ring? If you, can you photo bleach just the ring itself, like half of the ring? I, I tried really hard, but it's not easy to achieve. And, and um, the ring is also, so it's actually it's a, it's a, it's a sphere. Uh, right, it's a sphere. sphere. The right. ring, yeah. So yeah. the the is how to. So first of all, is, uh, my personal feeling is that the TDPs can the the this unstable non stable TDP can uh, have two states. One state is it binds to H H three seventy, mm -hmm. and the other state it binds to itself. When it binds to itself. They actually form this uh, concentrated structure, but this structure is uh, is uh, very unstable. So either it fall into the in, into the center. Now it actually HSV seventy work on it, and then actually make the structure slightly better, and then it goes out, uh, and then form this, and then somehow. So there is a clear boundary, which is actually very intriguing for for us and uh, for me and for Don is that where, what, what is the surface? Or like, where is the, this whiting? Uh, they call it whiting. So this surface, um, the, the interface, right? At this uh, droplet. So that I, th I think is one of an unsolved uh, problem. And many people think that maybe this is a bilayer, but actually the thickness is multiple layers. Uh, there's, there's no, there's no way that it's a bilayer, right? So, Very thick. so we, yeah, we, we don't really know. Yeah. And actually there are other proteins and protein and RNA complex have formed such a structure in neurons. One example is actually um, uh, SMA patient, um, the poly A, so the people did a poly A, a poly DT um, in situ hybridization in a, in a SMA mouse model. In the, in the late st stage of the disease, uh, our MRA can form this structure with, uh, I think with um, nuclear speckle proteins. So it's, it's not a uh, unique property for TDP. I actually found a few pr other protein can do this. So Hyang, I your observation that when you force the acetylation mimic mutant to the cytoplasm, it doesn't form these. I think that observation is very important. You said that it indicates there's some factor in the nucleus that's not, or that's, an additional factor that's required. Do you think it's HSP70 or do you think it's something else? So HSP70 uh, mostly um, depends on the uh, depends on the uh, iso uh, like the uh, the isoform. So um, some of them are actually high in the nucleus and some of them are high in the cytoplasm. Um, I don't think HSP70 is the unique uh, factor. Uh, I speculate is the RNA concentration because the nuclear RNA concentration is 10 times to, I think, I mean, nucleoplasm, the RNA concentration is 10 times more than the cytoplasm. During mitosis, now uh, the overall concentration in the, in, the, in the cytoplasm will be higher, which might maintain this um, structure. But I, again, it's just my speculation. I think also the nucleus is more, is a, very crowded um, environment. So maybe there are, I think there may be other factors that control this. Yeah. Got it. All right. Other, um, you can just see um, in the chat, um, someone asked, uh, tryptarin is also a proteasome inhibitor. Do you think the ah. effect is similar as partizumab? Okay. So Actually, I apologize. I didn't know that um, it could be a proteasome inhibitor. So um, the answer is yes. So proteasome inhibitor further drive the structure to become uh, gel. Um, and um, if it is through the proteasome, then I don't have any um, confidence on the H uh, HSP90 data yet. So I think that I need to use SRA uh, to determine 
the function of HSV 90 here. That's a very good there, suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can't. There, there are also there are other HSP90 inhibitors that you could you could test, but in, in any case. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll try them. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Awesome talk. Congratulations. And um it's long. Um, our two hundredth speaker. <laughs> oh yeah. So, my good <laughs> pleasure to introduce our two hundredth speaker. Uh, so Dr. Margaret Ho uh, He. So uh, actually, uh, Margaret's uh, Chinese name is He Shujun. So uh, Margaret is from uh, Shanghai Tech University, now the associate professor. So uh, Margaret has, has her PhD, uh, a better degree in Berkeley. After that, he, she went to uh, Harvard, did a department of molecular cell biology to work uh, with, with, uh, with the traditional transcription biology, as a hardcore trend as biochemist. So after PhD, uh, Margaret, went to the postdoc with Academia Senior in Taipei, uh, starting uh, where uh, she starting work with uh, a, a fly to use fly as, as a, a model organism to work on uh, a variety of biological questions. So uh, Margaret started her uh, assistant professorship at Tongji University uh, School of Medicine in Shanghai uh, 2010. And after uh, eight years, he, she moved to uh, Shanghai Tech University. So today uh, she will talk about the uh, the um, glia pretty status in your generation. So welcome, Margaret. Take it away. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think I can share my screen yet. So uh, is there? Uh, you should be able to. I, um, yeah. No. Uh, no, I can't. So this could you uh, could again? Let me see. Um, oh, let me see if I change some options. Okay. That's me sharing my screen. Okay. Yeah, I can yeah, yeah. you want to try again? Yeah, I don't I don't have the options uh sharing my screen. Okay, do you have the PowerPoint open? Yes, I do. Okay. Um should I go out and come in again? Maybe. That would be great. If you have a new Mac, you have to go into the preferences and allow it. They've recently initiated a Zoom block. So you have to go yeah. into your preferences, unlock it, add Zoom, and then it should open. <laughs> okay, hold on. This is but you, had, you tested your, your slides earlier and it worked. Yeah, well, what happened yeah. if you clicked the show today? I, so what happened? Uh, it tells me options saying something like there's only one uh, person joining the camp, uh, the conference that can share oh. and there's some options oh. so yeah they, yeah but is that just that margaret already the host right um hmm. okay now you're the host okay oh yeah ah, yeah 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 yeah, yeah okay. i can share now Great. yeah <laughs> wow. okay, okay thank you <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> Can you see my screen now? Yeah, yes. sure, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, uh, and you can hear show. me. Yeah, yeah, hold on, let me go. Okay, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for Zilong for the kind introduction and also for Aaron for having me on uh, Neuron Zoom. So in the middle of the lockdown here uh, in Shanghai, uh, Neuron Zoom is quite entertaining. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about our recent work on glioproteostasis and uh, neuron degeneration today. And uh, I would like to start with uh, proteostasis. Um, it is a homeostatic uh, process that involves protein synthesis, folding, and also multiplications of proteins that to ensure proteins can function properly. And any of these steps goes wrong could cause uh, aggregation and also accumulation of the proteins that uh, would eventually lead to disease such as cancer or neurological diseases. And in addition, uh, the aggregation and also the accumulation of the proteins uh, can be due to a dysfunctional degradation pathways such as uh, proteasome uh, autophagy or lysosome pathways. Uh, in a group of neurodegenerative disease such as uh, AOS or Parkinson's disease, protein aggregation, um, the so-called inclusion is the pathological hallmark for the uh, patient. And also um, these protein inclusions are often seen in neurons. 
But at the same time, researchers have found that uh, some of these inclusions were seen in uh, the other brain cell type cochlear cells. On the right, you will see images that are showing some of these inclusions uh, in the disease, such as multiple assistance atrophy, MSA, and also at the bottom for ALS patients. So uh, since we are seeing protein inclusions in uh, the major two, uh, the, it, these inclusions are quite prominent in both uh, brain cell types. Uh, it is really important to understand how these uh, protein aggregations are formed and how um, they can be eliminated so that we can understand the disease better and also uh, try to find a potential cure. In the past, uh, the autophagy pathway in neurons have been shown to be a major means for uh, clearing these protein aggregates. Some of the disease risk genes are associated with autophagy dysfunction as well. And it is proposed that under homeostatic uh, condition, these autophagosomes can be generated de novo at the exon terminal, and they can be trafficked back uh, to soma where they can uh, fuse with the lysosome and generate autolysosome for uh, substrate degradation. Under pathogenic condition, um, this, uh, the trafficking and, auto, uh, and the biogenesis of these autophagosomes uh, are disrupted so that uh, fewer autolysosomes can be formed and that will lead to uh, accumulation of protein aggregates and also uh, damaged organelles. So as uh, a group of biologists that are interested in glial cells, we then wonder whether there's a similar pathway like autophagy in glial cell that contributes to its proteostasis and also contributes to the elimination of protein inclusions in glial cell uh, during uh, neuron degeneration. My lab has been interested in uh, the fundamentals of glial cell for a while, and uh, we use the model organisms, Drosophila, and also we recently started some works using mice. So uh, I just want to point out that Drosophila glia are very similar to their mammalian counterparts. We have uh, extracellular glia and cortex glia. Both uh, glia cells are very similar to mammalian extracellular. They uh, mediate synapse formation and also synaptic function. And we also have ensheeding glia that ensheed the axon and provide insulation. And we have uh, surface glia that can establish the blood brain barrier. So uh, in short, Drosophila glia participate in virtually all aspects of neural development and also neuronal function. And it is very important to understand this uh, Drosophila glia as it provides insight into how mammalian glia cells function as well. So we have published a series of work on identifying the ubiquitin proteasome system as a major degradative pathway in glia cell. We uh, discovered some of the components along this pathway to regulate glia genesis and also neuronal, de neuronal development in Drosophila. And uh, recently we expanded our work onto uh, trying to understand how glial cell function in neuron degeneration. So we started out by establishing a fly model for uh, neuron degeneration using Parkinson's disease uh, as an example. As most of you know that uh, PD patients exhibit uh, the following symptoms, uh, progressive loss of locomotor activity and reduced lifespan and progressive DNA neuron loss and also alpha synic and Lewy body aggregates. Some of these symptoms can be recapitulated in uh, flies by analyzing uh, adult climbing activity in flies that uh, can mimic the movement disability. So we had this uh, semi-automatic machine uh, in the lab that can analyze hundreds of flies all at one time. We, we can also analyze Drosophila lifespan that can uh, mimic the early human death and we can also analyze um, the conserved DNA neuron clusters. We uh, can particularly, we analyze the DNA neuron number at the PPN12 cluster, which uh, cluster the DNA neurons in that specific cluster has been shown to degenerate upon alpha synuclein overexpression. So with all these tools, we will be able to identify new and novel glia specific factors that are involved in uh, PD. So we have conducted the screen and we uh, have found that uh, the PD risk factor cycling G associated kinase called GAK, uh, it's a glia specific factor involving PD. So in mammals, GAK, uh, it's homolog in Drosophila is named axon. Both GAK axon are ubiquitously expressed and uh, Drosophila axon is expressed in uh, both neurons and glia 
whereas uh, in mice, GAK expression is uh, higher in microglia cells. GAK is a serine surrounding kinase that uh, its mutations are associated with clinical PD patients. And also GAK has been found to regulate alpha synuclein expression levels. So we decided to uh, analyze and try to understand how we are GAK axon functions uh, in neuron degeneration. We inhibit axon expression in fly glia, and we found that this fly exhibits locomotor deficits in an age-dependent manner. We also found this fly exhibits shorter lifespan, and also we generate transgenic mice that uh, selectively lock down uh, GAK expression in microglia. And by footprint analysis, we found that these mice do not work properly. And by pore test, we found that the movement time for these mice move along the pore is significantly greater compared to the control litermate. So all these results suggest that lacking glia JK axon cause a locomotor deficit and also affect a fly lifespan. So next we want to uh, understand whether uh, JK axon uh, regulates DNA neuron degeneration as DNA neuron degeneration is a central pathology hallmark for PD. So in flies, we inhibit axon expression and we analyze the DNA, cell, uh, DNA neuron cell number in the PPN1 to cluster. And what we found is that um, the number in this particular cluster uh, decreased over time uh, in the age-dependent manner. And similarly, in the substantial nigra area where this area was most affected in PD, the DNA neuron cell number in, the, uh, in substantial nigra is significantly reduced uh, when the mice lack um, microglia GAK. So all this result uh, suggests that um, GAK arson uh, regulates uh, uh, DNA neuron degeneration. Uh, furthermore, I, we would like to know whether GAK arson participate in the degradation of alpha synuclein. Uh, we create a binary system that can uh, overexpress alpha synuclein in neurons and also manipulate gene expression in glial cell. And uh, we first test uh, whether this system works by analyzing uh, whether we can detect some of the uh, alpha synuclein in uh, glial cell when we overexpress alpha synuclein in neurons only. So what happens is that we do detect some uh, alpha synuclein uh, in the glial cell that we sorted uh, uh, from the fly adult brands. So this suggests that these neurons, uh, this alpha synuclein, uh, they were originally expressed in neurons. Uh, they can be transmitted from neurons to glia. So by inhibiting axon expression, uh, we found that it caused a general increase in the overall alpha uh, protein levels in fly adult brains. So um, similarly in mouse brain stasis, we tried to detect the pathological forms of alpha synuclein. And what we found is that the intensity against this uh, alpha synuclein is increased. And also the colocalization of alpha synuclein with microglia is also increased when the mice uh, lacks uh, microglia GAK. Uh, furthermore, when we analyze the colocalization of alpha synuclein with the autophagy component, such as LC3 or LAM1, um, we found the colocalization value increase when uh, lacking microglia GAK. So all these results will point to a role for glia GAK axon in the degradation of alpha synuclein and potentially through um, the autophagy pathway. In addition, what we found is that um, when lacking uh, GAK, it can cause microglia activation. As we analyze the microglia, uh, the, analyze the morphology for this microglia, what we found is that they exhibit shorter processes and also the terminal points of these processes are fewer. And also by standing CD68, which, can, which is the indicator for the phagocytic activity of microglia, we see an increase in this uh, phagocytic activity of this microglia. So all these results indicate that uh, GAK regulates microglia activation and lacking GAK can cause microglia to become activated into a state that is very similar to how microglia are uh, in uh, PD disease progression. So um, we conclude that uh, for, uh, until now that uh, we believe that uh, glia JK axon can mediate alpha synuclein degradation. So, what exactly is the mechanism and how does glia JK axon mediate alpha synuclein degradation? So, because of some of the previ previous findings implicating autophagy pathway as a possible uh, pathway for degrading alpha synuclein in glia, we decided to look at it in more details. 
we use the Josefa adult uh, brain as the system to analyze uh, the possible components such as lysosomes or autophagosomes in glial cells uh, in, in the brain. So what happens is that when we inhibit oxygen expression in glial cell, we found a dramatic increase in the intensity of LEN1 positive uh, lysosomes. But when we inhibit oxygen expression in the DNA neurons, we do not see such increase. And uh, more in-depth analysis also show that um, the number intensity, also the size of those uh, lysosomes, uh, glial lysosomes, all increase when um, the flies lacking glial oxygen. Uh, we also demonstrate uh, similar uh, things in um, a microglia cell line using a microglia cell line and also mouse uh, brain slices. So when we inhibit GAK expression in the microglia cell line, we found that lysosome aggregate and also the LEN1 positive intensity uh, in, uh, increase and also its colocalization with microglia also increase when um, the mice uh, is lacking uh, microglia GAK. So we also analyzed the number, um, the biogenesis of autophagosomes. So by labeling those autophagosomes using uh, mCherry ATGA marker, what we found is that this uh, autophagosome, the number for this autophagosome uh, increased significantly. And also using a single cell marker clonal analysis strategy, we will be able to um, analyze the autophagosome within one single glial cells. And what we found is that the number and the size of those autophagosomes in glial cell lacking oxygen all increase uh, compared to the control. Reintroducing fly oxygen or human GAK can uh, suppress the increase in this uh, autophagosome number, suggesting that the function for fly oxygen and human GAK are conserved in this context. So similarly, uh, we also found uh, defects in autophagosome biogenesis when we inhibit uh, JK expression in the microglia cell line and also in the mouse brain, uh, the OC3 intensity is increased and also its colocalization with microglia is also increased. So since there are uh, uh, biogenesis defects in uh, lysosome and autophagosome, so uh, we then wonder whether uh, glial oxygen participate in regulating the efficiency of the whole autophagy pathway. So we analyze the efficiency of autophagy by um, analyzing the autophagy flux, which we can uh, monitor the dual reporter uh, in vivo. It's a GAP and Cherry ATGA uh, reporter. What we found is that um, uh, upon inhibiting oxygen expression, autophagy flux is indeed impaired and we observe some enlarged autolysosomes that potentially are fused. And also uh, they are co-positive for uh, both N-cherry and also GAP. So this suggests that this enlarged autolysosome, although they are uh, already fused, they uh, cannot degrade substrate probably due to a, a, a unfavorable environment for substrate degradation. Because if they are acidic enough, they should be able to quench the GAP signal, but that's not what we're seeing here. So uh, we verify again to analyze um, substrate protein level. And what we found that in addition to the alpha nucleus that we previously described, the ubiquitin and also PCC2 uh, substrates will also uh, accumulate when uh, lacking glial oxygen. So um, this result suggests that uh, glial oxygen is an important component in the glial autophagy process. All our immunostaining results are backed up by our EM data as when we analyze the brain, the EM uh, data from the brain slices. What we found is that the number of autophagosome and lysosome and also for autolysosome numbers uh, will all increase. So um, together, this result suggests that lacking GAK, oxen, uh, lacking glial oxygen can disrupt the uh, autophagy trafficking and GAK oxygen uh, is uh, regulating um, the autophagy trafficking uh, in general. So um, to this end, we believe that uh, JK oxygen mediates alpha secretion degradation via glial autophagy. So now uh, what is uh, the mechanism of JK oxygen regulating glial autophagy? Exactly which set of the autophagy that JK oxygen is uh, uh, regulating? So um, we analyze uh, all different steps along the autophagy pathway and 
um, the end result is that we found uh, JK accident regulate autophagy initiation, a uh, very earlier step of the autophagy. So we knew that because we first analyzed um, the uh, protein level ATJA2, which is an indicator for bio, uh, autophagosome biogenesis. What we found is that when inhibiting uh, oxygen expression, we see an increase of the uh, protein level of a ADJA2. And this increase is further enhanced by the treatment of BEFA1, which blocks fusion. So this uh, piece of result uh, demonstrate that JK oxygen, uh, oxygen plays a direct role in um, autophagy in initiation. Uh, we also analyzed the uh, protein level of um, uh, components in the initiation complex and also PI3P complex. Both complex are important uh, complex regulator for autophagy initiation. What we found is that there's a general increase in the um, uh, protein level of these components, particularly the phosphorylation of the serine 757 at the, uh, for the master regulator ULK1 uh, is decreased when lacking JK. So because this phosphorylation at this particular rescue, it's an inhibitory signal that is conferred by mTOR. So uh, our results suggest that lacking JK would uh, enhance your K1 activity. So uh, it will actually promote your K1 activation. So we also monitor in vivo factor four nucleation and also uh, omegasome formation, all earlier steps for the autophagy initiation. And uh, we monitor this in flies and also in cell culture. And what we found is that indeed there's a general increase in the number of uh, omegasome and also in the efficiency of this uh, process such as factor four nucleation. And um, this together uh, all point to a role for uh, GK oxygen in autophagy initiation. So during the quest for understanding how GK oxygen uh, regulates autophagy initiation, we found that the protein level of this master regulator ULK1 and in fly it's called ATG1, uh, is greatly enhanced by oxygen. So in flies, it's enhanced by oxygen and also in cell culture, uh, we see similar results that the OK1 level is enhanced. And uh, together with our result in the last slide that uh, OK1 ATG1 activity is upregulated in um, uh, cells that lacking JK, we then wonder whether OK1 ATG1 is a direct substrate for JK oxygen. So we perform co-IP analysis and what we found is that they do directly interact. And uh, we delete each of the individual domains of axon or ULK1 and uh, trying to narrow down the domains that uh, are responsible for their interaction. So what we found is that for axon, the J domain at the C terminus is required for ATG1, its interaction with ATG1. And for uh, ULK1, the C terminus domain, CTD domain, is required for its interaction with GAK. So with all this uh, interaction information, we will be able to um, investigate further how, um, GK, uh, how ULK1 can add as a downstream substrate of GAK and how uh, GAK regulate its function. But at the same time, we also want to know uh, GAK accent, uh, how GAK accent regulates autophagy initiation um, at the cellular level. So uh, we decided to analyze the colocalization of ULK1 and um, autophagosome. And um, the autophagosome is labeled by ATGA. So uh, by analyzing the colocalization, uh, colocalization of these two factors, we will be able to know the trafficking efficiency of ULK1, ATG1 being trafficked to the autophagosomes. And this is a major step underlying the auto, uh, autophagy initiation. So uh, in flies, when we inhibit oxygen expression, we will be able to uh, see that we actually saw an increased colocalization of uh, ULK1 and ATGA. So this result suggests that JK oxygen can regulate autophagy initiation via um, controlling the ULK1, ATG1 trafficking. And we obtain similar results in the cell culture by inhibiting JK expression that we also see an increased colocalization between um, ULK1 and LC3. So this result confirmed again our fly data. So uh, we believe that glia JK acid mediates alpha synuclein degradation via controlling the ULK1 ATG1 activity and uh, its trafficking. So the current model is that uh, under physiological condition, JK acid plays a suppression role in suppressing the autophagy in induction. Um, so under pathological condition, then uh, lack of JK, uh, for example, 
some of GLK SNPs are implicated in PD that could cause a potential reduction in GLK expression, uh, could promote autophagy initiation, and it could uh, initiate glia clearance program for clearing the alpha C nucleus. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge people who have done the work. Shi uh, Ping, Shuanglong, and Ling Fang, they have done tremendous amount of work in trying to understand how uh, GAK oxygen functions in the cell. I want to thank reagent providers and collaborators and also funding agency. And uh, thank you. And I will take questions. Great. Thanks, Margaret. Yeah. Now open for questions. Mian, do you want to ask questions? Okay, please go ahead. Hi, Margaret. A uh, very nice talk. So, uh, I have a question. In the mammalian cells, there are two um, oxygen genes, oxygen and GAG, right? The GAG, the GAG is called oxygen 2. So, in your mouse model study, when you knock down, you only knock down GAG or you try to, uh, to knock down both of them? I only, we only knock down GAG. Uh, get expression because it's the uh, it's most uh, similar to fly oxygen. So we didn't we didn't analyze uh, ox the other oxygen. That is, I think its expression is neuronal specific. Correct. So so in the glial cell, uh, only get uh, expressed there, or the oxygen is also expressed. Uh, it was predicted to be so. Yes, yeah, because get is uh, expression is ubiquitously expressed, but uh, oxygen is only is preferentially expressed in neurons. So that's why we only knock down uh, get expression. Yeah. yeah. The second question actually is because it's uh, the well-known function of these two is clustering on coating, but now you mm -hmm. find the same normal function in the autophage. So is there any mm -hmm. involvement of the clustering media and the cytosis in this pathway or yeah, anything? Yeah, else? that's a great. Yeah, that's a great question because we have been trying to figure out whether um, JK oxygen mediates autophagy is independent, is related to its clustering and coding function. Well, um, we don't have a, a like, clear answer yet, but uh, what I can tell you is that when we overexpress the CBD domain of uh, oxygen, which is responsible for its clustering and coding activity, we do not see similar phenotype as what we saw in, uh, when we knocked down oxygen. So it is possible that they are two separate independent functions. Yeah, yes. in uh, at least at least in flies, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting yeah. talk. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Hayang, please. Uh, on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question about how um the microglia handles um uh, the alpha nucleus from neurons. So does neurons secrete the alpha-synuclein vesicles uh, or maybe alpha-synuclein protein uh, through mm -hmm. the like the uh, axon terminals or how, mm -hmm. how does that part work? Yeah, that, that's a, a very intriguing question because um, we, we have been wondering about that too. But um, uh, what, what I know is that alpha-synuclein can be transported via like, for example, extracellular vesicles. Uh, from neurons, they can be secreted from neurons, and they, they are literature have demonstrating that uh, microglia can uptake those uh, alpha synuclein. So that's about all we know that it can uptake alpha synuclein, and I think it's via endocytosis pathway. Yeah, but the forms that exactly how alpha synuclein is released from uh, neurons is still quite a debate. So um, we we don't know yet. Yeah. I see. Would there be like a obviously nuclein uh, receptor or binding partner on the surface of microglia? Or? Yeah, it's, it's very possible. Yes, I think at one time Mark Cousin was, uh, they identify, uh, I'm not sure, I, I don't think it's microglia specific, but it's a new receptor, LAG3, that responsible for alpha uh interaction. I forgot whether it's microglia specific or not, but uh, people have been trying to look for a uh, new and specific receptor that can uh, receive alpha synuclein. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. So I would, a short question about the Margaret. So uh, 
um, it's very amazing to microglia is on topic. So, so, um, so for people who are also arguing about some uh, topics happening in astroglia, so how do you think about mm -hmm. that? Will that will be also play a role in, in mm -hmm, terms mm -hmm. of, let's see, I don't know yeah, how, it, how to think about yeah. it. Yeah, it's it's very possible because um, I think during PD or at least in yeah. degeneration, actual cell and microglia they can interact with each other and they actually uh -huh. regulate each other's inflammation. So um, and also exercise have been shown to uptake alpha synuclein as well. So yeah. it is very possible that uh, alpha uh, exercise can also utilize autophagy pathway to degrade alpha synuclein. We we didn't really look into exercise in um, in this story, but uh, it's a good direction to go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, is there any more questions? Okay. So is it no more questions? Thanks, thanks to great speakers. Our um, uh, two years anniversary and the 100th anniversary as well. Thank you. Uh, okay. I would I would like to thank all your all of your attenders and the speakers so for making this happen. So that's uh, as let it carry it on so that we can more uh, great science. We we'll thank your um, thank you. assistance as a host, a weekly host, <laughs> both of you. Great, great, great pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Thank everyone. you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you guys. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. See you all. Bye. Yeah. Good luck. Thanks, Bye. 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 B